Praise God. It seems like one theme this morning, both implicit and explicit, is that we need the Lord in our weakness, don't we? Uh, but I thank God for those times when He reminds us of who we are and who He is and the fact that we need Him and the fact that He's more than willing to reach out and to help us and to meet with us right where we're at. Thank God. Thank God for His faithfulness. Um, you know, I've had thoughts kind of come and go, but mostly come in the last 24 hours or so. Um, I remember years ago when I first came to the, to the church, hearing probably a recording, I think, of Brother Thomas preaching a message on uh, using what you have, a God-given vision and using what you have was the way he titled it. And it was uh, based principally in John chapter 6. I don't want to try to re-preach that message uh, but there are some themes there that I, I sense that the Lord wants us to get in a deeper way, perhaps, and, may, and maybe in a, I hope in a more personal way, because sometimes it's easy to see these great themes of the Bible and imagine they're up there, they're for the special people, and not really to get down to where you and I walk every single day, and that's what we need. Uh, we need to know how to walk and how to grow and how to, how to serve the Lord. So Jesus has been ministering, and they're trying to get some, get a, go to a place of rest. And uh, it says, sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs. So you see the... the the, you see what's the motivation behind a lot of people following is really not what, what it needs to be, but yet in that God works uh, to reach those of His. But you're gonna, you see a whole lot when they find out what it means to, to follow the Lord, to serve Him. They're, they love the signs, but they don't want that. But anyway, they saw the miraculous signs He had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with His disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. That's a pretty big need, isn't it? Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? So Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. And so, of course, the people reacted to this. He goes on uh, to say they wanted to make him king, and he, you know, he discerned this and left. You know, uh, people are certainly uh, seeking for things of this world, aren't they? That's the, that's, they're looking for fleshly advantage, and you see that in the reaction of the people. But there is a lesson in this that I believe is certainly relevant to me. I sense it. I, I, I sense many times the Lord wanting, uh, you know, on a Sunday morning especially, I feel my weakness, and I have to just say, God, you have to do this because I can't. And, uh, and yet that isn't just for somebody who would stand up here. That's for every single one of us. And our inclination is, first of all, to, to be rather unbelieving and, and not, not imagining that we could possibly uh, have anything much to do with the kingdom of God. We're just sort of bench warmers in the kingdom. Uh, we, we don't have, we're not important like some people, and, and so we just kind of come and muddle through. But here was Jesus First of all, we know from his own testimony that he didn't do anything randomly, did he? There was a relationship with the Father where he sought God. He sought his Father, not knowing himself what to do. He got the wisdom and the direction from his Father, didn't he? And so it, the Scripture here tells us that Jesus you know, said something to test, uh, was it Philip? 
And, uh, but he, he only did it to test him because he already knew what was going to happen. And there was a, if you will, there was a God-given vision. There was a sense that, that God was allowing a circumstance to come about that they didn't particularly plan. But uh, they were going to be in a circumstance where they, there was a need and they didn't have the natural means to meet that need. And, you know, that's a pretty good picture of life if we see it in, the true, in its true light. The reality is God has called every one of us to a life that we, that's impossible for us to live in our own strength. It's impossible to do anything related to the kingdom of God, anything of eternal value. It's impossible simply to take natural resources, natural abilities, and accomplish anything that will be eternal. We need the Lord. We need Him. Every single one of us needs Him. And so, uh, you know, obviously, you see, the, you see the reaction, the same reaction that probably every one of us would have had. Uh, you know, we, it's going to take eight months' wages to give everybody a bite. That's pretty serious reckoning on the, on the breadth and the depth of the need. But you also see the natural reasoning. All Philip and the other disciples could see was there's a big need. We don't have the resources. And they're just thinking in those terms of, of we've got to have something. And, you know, Jesus, if he'd been like a lot of modern executives and modern leaders, would have said, what's the matter with you guys? Can't you plan ahead? You know, couldn't you have anticipated this? We should have had all this stuff in, in, in uh, you know, in the operation. We should have had the infrastructure to meet this need. What's, you know, we got to get, get organized here. But it wasn't that way at all with Jesus. There was a perfect rest, and he realized how the kingdom of God works. It does not work with human resources. It does not work with human ability. It doesn't work with human reasoning or any resource that has to do with this life. You know, uh, we heard a message, you know, that was a wonderful confirmation to a lot of things the Lord's been, been saying lately. Wednesday night, for those of you who were here, uh, you got to hear that message by Brother Jim Symbol on, and I believe it was something like his life or ours. God's purpose in calling, him to, calling us to himself is not that we try to be a different people, and, uh, you know, we adopt a Christian lifestyle and all of that, and we simply take the energy of Adam and try to redirect it into the things of, of Christ. It doesn't work that way. Adam ain't going to do that. You can pretend and put on an outward front, but you haven't changed anything in the heart. That was the problem with the Pharisees. They had their religion, but they didn't have anything to do with God. And we need, we need the, the life of God to flow out through us to be what we are, to energize what we do. And it isn't just for the people who are in visible places of service or doing some great thing. This is for you and me every day in our lives. God wants to live in and through us. That's what we were designed for. This is not just some, oh, I, I, let's figure out how to fix this. This is what you and I were designed for. We've said this a number of times lately. We were designed to be energized by the Spirit of God and yet retain all of our individuality. It's amazing. God didn't make you like me or me like you, but he made every one of us to have a, a place, a, a, an honored place in his kingdom. And you and I were designed exactly the way God wanted us to be designed. But it, there's another dimension that I, wanted, that I want to... Uh, bring into this today, and that is the fact that we have what we need. Just let that sink in. We, we live as though, oh, if I had this, if I were this, if I were smarter, if I were, you know, stronger willed, if I had more money, if I had more time, if I had, uh, you know, something. Some of you would uh, will remember Brother Thomas telling a story years ago. Uh, I don't remember the exact circumstances, but somehow he was called upon to visit a woman in her, who lived in a trailer with four kids. And his commentary on the condition was rather dire. It was, uh, you know, the place was filthy. The kids, were, the kids were a mess. The dishes were piled up. Nothing was of the normal housekeeping was being done. And she was in distress Oh, God has called me to this great and wonderful work, and I look at, you know, and I just can't, I can't do it. Oh, something's terribly wrong. And Brother Thomas's comment about this, I don't know if it's to her or not, but his comment about this was, yeah, God has called her to a great work, and she's not doing it. 
He called her to wipe the kids' noses and clean their clothes and, and, you know, and, carry, and make a house for them. And that, she has a work that she has no idea how, how important that is and how significant it is. And if she would give herself to that, if there's anything, if there's anything God wants, you know. But we are, we are forever thinking that, oh, if. The devil is the author of what if or if only. If only I were this, if I, if I were talented like somebody else, I could do this. And it just, the kingdom doesn't work that way. And so we see in Jesus, first of all, someone who did not come and live according to his own ability. That sounds like a strange thing for the Son of God to come to earth, to be born as a man, and to live a life of dependence. One would think, hey, this has got to be the smartest man that ever lived, the wisest, the strongest, that, you know, and all these attributes. But he didn't come that way. He came to live as a man who, was, who understood his place, who was given to the Father's will, who gave the Father everything that he had, and the Father used him to accomplish his purpose, lived in and through him, empowered him to do whatever he did. And so here's a the, here's the circumstance where it was, a, it was a way to graphically illustrate the principle by which he lived. And simply, God has in his wisdom allowed us to come into a circumstance where it's obvious we don't have what we need. Now, one thing you do not see in Jesus is the least little bit of anxiety. Does anybody here have anxiety when you come into those circumstances? Yeah like 100% of us. That's kind of the way we work. That's our default setting. Oh my God, something is here. I've got to handle this. I don't have what I need. Oh God, you know, like, like something's wrong. And the fact is something is right if we can only understand it. And Jesus was not, like I say, he was not at all distressed. And instead of bemoaning what they lacked, he said, Father, I thank you. Thank you for what, what we have. Thank you for what you've given us. Lord, I thank you for it. And the Lord was able to take that little bit that was thankfully offered to God and make it enough to meet the need. Isn't that an amazingly simple principle? God took that. Jesus, I mean, the disciples and Jesus didn't need trucks and vans to, full of food to to help the people. Camels, I guess it would have been that day. But whatever. They didn't need the normal supply lines. They just needed God. And they needed to, be, needed to have a sensitivity to what is his purpose and what is his goal in all of this. Lord, we're, we're okay. We have what we need. Here we are in a situation where there is no natural answer. But we actually have what we need. So what we need to do then is not to sit here and, and worry and plan and fret and do any of the things that you and I do every single day. To be honest, we do it. Instead say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for what you have given me. Lord, I just give it to you. You've put before me something I can't do, but you can. And do we not see this throughout the Scriptures? I mean, we, we use these examples all the time. And, uh, you know, we think of, of Moses, and, and in his case, God had to do something to destroy his own self-confidence so that he would not rise up and say, I'm the, I grew up in Pharaoh's house, I can handle anything, because that's how he grew up. That was the mentality that you would get in that environment. But God had to bring him down to a place where only God, only the blessing of God could accomplish what God wanted. And so all of a sudden, you find Moses having lived for 40 years in the wilderness tending sheep. He's 80 years old. When God's, God finally begins to reveal his plan and his vision for Moses, Moses does nothing but argue with him. You know, Isaiah at least said, here am I, send me. Moses said, here am I, send Aaron. No matter what he did, he, what the Lord said, he had objections like, I, don't, I just haven't got what it takes. I don't have anything. So here's the Lord. Now, let's, let's, let's back up a second. The Lord's ready to deliver. Okay, Lord, what's your plan? Well, I've got an 80-year-old guy with a stick 
who has no self-confidence, no desire to do anything, no ambition. That's how I'm going to do it. But you see how the Lord works, doesn't he? So that everybody knows, man, there's, there's no, no human ability. No one can glory. No one can say, look what I did. It's always going to be, look what God did. But isn't that liberating? Because if we're honest and we realize our limitations, I don't want my efforts. I don't want something that comes out of, of Adam, the Adam life in me. I don't want that getting in the way. That's what God is delivering us from. Oh, how we fight that. Oh, how we struggle and wish and, and you know, try to hang on to this and hang on to that or worry about what we don't have. And here's, here's Moses finally saying, okay, I'll go. And so God delivers millions of people from the greatest empire of its day with an 80-year-old man with no self-confidence and a stick. And all he does is simply say, okay, God, what's next? And I know that in the, in the beginning, it was true. He didn't even do his own speaking. I guess at some, time, at some point, he probably started to some degree, but, you know, he, he whispered to Aaron, Aaron, tell him this. And Aaron, would, Aaron would be the one, be the spokesman. You know, we, we get this picture from, uh, from the movie of Charlton Heston, this, this imposing character. But I'll tell you, Moses, it says of him later on, he was the meekest man on the face of the earth. You talk about a guy who couldn't stand up for himself, who was just anything, the polar opposite of the guy we would have picked. But God picked him to show who he is. And he accomplished great things. Folks, we don't have to be something for God to, have a, to use us in his place and his purpose for his kingdom and his glory. All he needs is somebody who will say, thank you, Lord for exactly what you've given to me. I give it to you. I offer myself. You know, and you go on through the Scriptures and you will see this principle played out in lives over and over and over again. Uh, you know, one, one came to me and I was just thinking about what, what did he have to offer. Joseph certainly was an example. But maybe in a different way. There wasn't some implement that he had that I remember. Uh, I, I don't recall some thing some physical object being associated with him. But I'll tell you one thing Joseph had in all of his experiences of being betrayed by his brothers, sold as a slave, lied about, winding up in prison, there was one thing he had that he continually offered to God was his integrity. He said, God, I, in his faith, he said, God, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to be the kind of person you want me to be, and I don't care where you put me. I'm going to continue to serve you. I'm going to just give you myself. My life is yours. If you want me to serve you in the prison and simply be a good, trusted man that can be, you know, man that can be trusted to help watch out for things and care about people, then that's what I'm going to do. Lord, I'm, I'm in your hands. Now, yes, there was one time he tried to engineer his own deliverance a little bit, uh, show that he was human. But when that didn't happen, he didn't say, God's forgotten me. Oh, poor me, I'll never amount to anything. I guess those dreams I had were just a waste of time. They were fantasy. There was a, there was a steadiness about him that God had built into him. I'll tell you, folks, we need that. We need to have something in us that is so surrendered that we recognize that our lives are truly not our own. And that was part of the message the other night, that we learned to say, Jesus, you are I, I belong to you. You are my life. And I think you could add to that, live in me. So there's a, there's, a, there's a reaching out to him. Lord, you just live in me. I need you. And of course, we, you know, we know the other stories from, from the Scriptures. We, we know about uh, David and how God worked in him. And when God came to, came to deliver them from the, the challenge of Goliath, he didn't use the army. He didn't raise up some great army. He, he, he had a shepherd boy who had somehow spent time with God, somehow learned enough about God that he knew that if he would just simply do what was in front of him, trust God, God would do the rest. You suppose there just might be a little bit of a lesson for us? See, when David was learning all this, he wasn't doing something important. 
in the eyes of the world. He was the least of his father's sons in the eyes of the world. You know, remember when Samuel went to anoint, the, anoint somebody? Samuel was looking at it through natural eyes, and man, the firstborn stood there, and he was tall, strapping, handsome, accomplished. Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. And the Lord said, nope, he's not the one. Man doesn't, I mean, man looks on the outward appearance. God looks in the heart. And somehow the youngest son was out there in the sheep, simply doing what came to hand. My God, is there a lesson in that? Do you see how God valued something that in the eyes of men was so ordinary that, every, that it was despised? A shepherd? Yeah, sure. He's going, to lead, he's going to be king one day. Give me a break. That doesn't compute. That doesn't make sense in human terms. But here is a shepherd who learned how to walk with God and he didn't, he didn't sit there and so focus on the future. Oh, I'm going to be king one day. I've got to, I, I just don't pay any attention to the sheep. Wolves come get them. Doesn't make any difference. I'm going to be king. No, he was a man who was faithful where he was, looked to God for, the, for every circumstance to the point where when a lion came, when a bear came, he was right out there to, uh, to deliver them. And he just, he didn't, he didn't back down. He said, my job is to take care of the sheep, and I'm going to use what I've got. Picking up on something there? Using what you have? Well, what did he have? He had a sling. He had his bare hands. He had his courage. He just had God is what he had. And so he went with that kind of an attitude and a spirit. I'm going to do what God has put in front of me to do, and I'm depending not on me but on him. And I'm going to serve God. And so God gave him that experience of knowing that God would be with him when he did God's work. And now all of a sudden he's facing a giant that everybody else is terrified of. And, you know, we've heard the story so many times. But I just pray that there's something that will, be, that will become more relevant to you and to me because we look at that as the great stuff, the really important stuff in history. And who am I? I can't ever be like that. Now, is anybody here that the Lord has, that the devil rather has not said that to? Every single person is minimized in their own eyes. You don't amount to, you're not important, you're a failure, you're this, you're that. Yeah, in natural terms, we may be all of those things. But I'll tell you, in the economy of God, God doesn't look for that kind of people. I'm getting a little bit ahead there, but that's all right. Praise God. And so, of course, we know how the story plays out. Saul, Saul tries to put his armor, figures he needs at least some protection, some advantage. Here, try my armor at least. And, of course, he says, I haven't proven this stuff. I can't even move in it hardly. Way too big for me. And so he takes his sling. He takes what he knows. He takes what he's used to. He takes what God has given him. And with a sling, and he didn't even need the other four stones. He needed one stone and God. And you think about the stories like Gideon and how, you know, we, we've used the story many times of how an angel came to talk to him and said, thou mighty man of valor, and he looks around. Is there somebody here I don't know about? And the Lord had to really convince him, look, I have chosen you. I know you're nobody. It's not about who you are in the natural. I'm, I've called you to do something. I've given you a vision. And you trust me, you look to me, I will be with you in it. And of course, how the Lord brings him to a place finally where he gets everybody aroused to, to fight the Midianites and all of a sudden, you know, they're already a little bit outnumbered with, what is it, 32,000? And uh, the Lord says, there's too many. Send them home. The ones that are afraid, send them home. 22,000 go home. Okay, maybe we can make it with 10. He's still looking at natural. You see how the tendency is to look at natural resources? Maybe we can come up with a strategy with 10,000. He says, nope, got to that's too many. You win the battle with 10,000, you're going to think you did something special. And you remember what Gideon did and how smart he was and, the, and all of that stuff. That will go down in history. Your name will be great because of what you did. No, God is going to get the glory. Because the reality is, I don't care what you accomplish in this world. I don't care what it is. If it's not God accomplishing it through you, 
It has no eternal value. And what do we want? Do you want to make a name here or do you want to have something that will last? And I believe God's purpose for every single person that he calls to his kingdom is to have fruit that will last forever and ever and ever. And so, of course, you remember the story how the Lord weeded them down to 300. <laughs> and then he, he sent them into battle armed. I mean, what, do they have to, what do they have to fight with? Basically, they had a clay pot and they had a, a, a what do you call it? A torch is, is the right word. I think it calls it lamps in some translation, but it was a torch. Basically, they lit a torch, hid it inside a clay pot, and the Lord placed them around the camp of the Midianites. And all of a sudden, on a signal, they smash that, and suddenly they're surrounded by light, and the Lord sends confusion into the other camp, and they don't even have to fight. And I'll tell you what, God can win the battles in our lives. The reality is, if you're sitting there thinking, I, am, I don't have what I need for this battle, you have what you need. You have what you need. Throughout the whole of Scripture, you see that pattern over and over again. You know, I remember, and you can go through many other Scriptures, but I remember hearing about when I grew up, and I think I've mentioned this before, a lady from the late 1800s, I suppose, uh, who lived in New York City, known as Sophie the Washerwoman. And, uh, you know, I grew up in a movement started by A.B. Simpson, and he was a great man of God, founder of a missionary movement, and a great preacher. And just to give you a little bit of an idea of how things have changed just a bit, there were times when his sermons were featured on the front page of the New York Times. You think things have maybe changed just a bit? You see, how, you see where, the, where things are trending? And I'll tell you, the Lord's in charge, isn't he? But anyway, this was a woman known to him, and by every earthly measure, man, she was nobody. She had no education. She made her life, she made her living doing washing, I, I presume laundry of some sort, personal laundry, just barely enough to feed herself. I mean, I mean, really just humble, hardworking. And, and it would be so easy for a person like that just to say, hey, I'll, I'll show up on Sunday, but I am nobody in the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter. But you know what she did? That woman is still talked about today in some circles because she gave everything that she had to the Lord. She lived, she sat there and counted her pennies and her nickels, and of course they meant something in those days, and she counted, I mean, she kept track of everything, and this is what I need to live. She, she worked out a way where she could subsist, have enough to eat. What did she do with the rest? She gave it to support foreign mission work. But not only that, there was, a, there was such a life and such a, test, a living testimony in this woman. She touched people's hearts everywhere she went. There were all kinds of people who just encountered her and they saw Christ in her and she was able to share the gospel and God reached out. I mean, she did. there's going to be people on the other side. It's going to be something. There will be famous preachers, some of whom don't even know the Lord. And I'll tell you, when it comes to who, who accomplished something of eternal value, there's going to be a lot of Sophie the Washerwoman type people who will stand there and say, I put this person in a humble place in the world. They gave me everything they had. And look at the lives I was able to touch. There are, look at all those people over there. They're here because of her. You see, there's nobody that has an excuse just to say, I don't have what I need, so I guess I'll just show up. I'll be a, I'll be a spectator in the kingdom of God. And it's not a matter of running out and trying to find something to do either. You know, that, that occasion uh, where we started, Jesus didn't go looking for that. It was just in the normal course of events. There was a need presented and a vision and a burden to do something about that. And God did something miraculous to meet the need. He took what they had offered to him, thankfully, you know, I've had that come to my mind several times. I, you know, the, there's a part of me that wants to complain about being tired and weak. I'm like you. 
I don't like it. But you know, what God is looking for from every one of us is, is a heart that says, thank you, Lord. Paul gloried in his weakness, didn't he? He gloried in it. He said, man, this is what I'm going to boast about. God didn't put me in a position where I could just boast because I'm the Apostle Paul. I've had these great revelations. I'm in a high place. I can help you right where you're, down there where you're at. He was right down there with them. And when he realized God's way of working, he said, man, it's not important to be capable. It's important to be available. And, and weak, actually, is a good thing because it reminds me that I need him. And so when I'm reminded that I need him, I cry out to him and I say, oh God, here's a need you've put before me. I can do nothing to meet it, but I just give myself to you and you're going to have to do this. That's how the kingdom of God works. We think that's the exception and that's actually the rule. That's how God does stuff. And so here's Here's that Sophie the washerwoman. My, what an amazing story that is. But, you know, history is just full of, of occasions of people like that. We mentioned Susanna Wesley. Nobody here would ever have heard of this simple woman who just raised a household, raised a couple of boys, except that she was a woman of prayer who gave herself to the place that God had put her and the, the impact of her life indirectly continues today. Because it was her prayers that undergirded the ministry of John and Charles Wesley who turned the world of their day upside down. Do you think that would have happened had it not been for a faithful, praying mother? Do you think God is going to say, you know, thanks, Susanna, for the little bit you did, but oh, these wonderful men. No, I'll tell you, this is going to go back to her. God is going to lift her up as an example of what he can do with somebody the world would write off as nobody. I'll guarantee if we went into, if we did some psychoanalysis or whatever, if we looked into somebody's inner life, I'll guarantee these people here that the devil has really hammered in your mind, I'm nobody. I don't matter. I'm not even sure if God loves me. I, I, I'm not important. I don't have abilities like somebody else. I can't do this. I can't do that. So I'm just nobody. And, and we, get, we wind up being paralyzed by lies of the enemy. God made you. Didn't make you to listen to the enemy and be his, be his slave. God made you the way he made you. And you have everything you need to serve God. What he's looking for from every one of us. And if what you have is weakness and inability, say, thank you, Lord. I offer my weakness and inability. Show me what to do. Just help me to put one foot in front of another. I'm, I don't have to go looking for some great crusade that's great in the eyes of men. I can just do what comes to my hand, like David. I'm a shepherd, I'll be a good shepherd. Like Joseph, if I'm a prisoner, I'm just going to be, I'm going to be a faithful servant of God right here, and I'm going to serve him right where I'm at. I'm going to let him worry about the big picture. My life's in his hands. It's not about me. It's not about this world. It's not about all the things that men make it about. Oh, I'll tell you what. God can do more with nothing than he can do with all of our everything that we would amass and try to say, we're going to do something great for you, God. That isn't how it worked, and that isn't how it worked with Jesus. He just gave himself. I mean, what greater picture is there of one who just simply gave himself to the Father? Said, God, I give you my weakness. I, I, I don't have anything but just myself to offer, but I offer you all the way right down to the cross. Lord, Father, just accomplish your purpose. I know it's your, your heart of love, and I'm completely on board with what you want to do for all these countless numbers of people that are lost and are headed for death because of sin. I give myself to you in all of my weakness. I'm willing to come to a place of weakness and then humble myself down to die. What a model. What a model 
Oh, it's hard for us to identify because we think of Jesus as, well, he's the son of God. He can do anything. Not in his earthly sojourn, he couldn't. He's the one who said, I can by myself do what? Nothing. By myself. I can't do, no I can't do anything. That's, that's hard for us, our minds to compute. We've heard about, oh, he's the son of God. He, he could just command this and do that and do the other. He, was, he occupied the place that you and I occupy. He had his unique place in the calling of God. And he moved in that. But so do you. Your place might not be great in the eyes of men. You might just be a, just, you might be a homemaker. Lord, help me to be the kind of homemaker. Help me to be the kind of husband. Help me to, you know, every one of us, if we read these, these words, we're going to, and the, the, what, a picture of what God wants us to be. Every one of us will look at this if we're honest and say, oh, I, I just don't have what it takes. I can't be that. I can't do that. I, I struggle and I strive. But what is God looking for? What is he looking for? What does he want? He just wants us to surrender and say, Lord, you didn't call me because I was capable. You know, I've mentioned this before. I'm certainly no great preacher by any stretch. But I'll never forget the first time I was called to, to speak you know, it's one thing to stand up and recite something or play the trumpet or, you know, some, something that I, was, I got used to. Uh, but to actually be the speaker for a group of people, oh, <laughs> that was not. And my first assignment was actually a group of young people in a living room. And before I went out to speak, I was in the bathroom struggling not to be sick. When God called me, he didn't look for somebody that had the ability. Folks, I don't. None of us has the ability to be, any, to be what God wants us to be. You know, a scripture that fits very well into this and when we know, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I believe it is, Obviously, there's a lot of things you could say about this, but I, 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 just want to, I, I just want the point to be clear. I don't know. I just, I'm trusting God will do something for somebody through this because I can't. But think of what Paul writes here in verse 26 of chapter 1. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth, but God. Praise God. Isn't that an awesome expression in the Scriptures? Amen. This such and such and such is the case. But God. That's, that trumps everything. Praise God. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. Why would he do such a ridiculous thing? So that no one may boast before him. Folks, if we could see the truth, we know, well, I think we know, those of us who know him, we know that we have nothing to boast about. There's not a single thing that we could go up and say, God, look what I did. I'm so great. You should reward me. Oh, my God. The picture in, the, in Revelation is, is of saints casting down their crowns at his feet. I mean, there'll be rewards, but we're going to look to him and say, my God, you did it all. You did it. You're the one who deserves the glory. You're the one who deserves the praise. Oh, open our eyes here to see this, to see God's way of doing things. And then we look and we see, how did I, how did I get to this place? What can I, what, to what can I attribute the fact that I even know him, that he cares about me? It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. It comes from him, not us. Who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. But now we look at Paul himself. You know, we're, we're inclined to look at somebody like Paul and think, this was a capable guy. 
This was, guy, this was a guy who was trained in the schools of his day. If anybody was qualified to do what he did, boy, God picked the right guy. Full of zeal. But by Paul's own testimony, God had to do something about that, just like he did with Moses. God had to bring him down to where he realized his strength was useless. Not only was it useless, it was in the way of everything that God would, wanted to do. And, and look at him years into his, after his conversion. This is a long period of time. Now he's writing about his visit to them. He says, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the message we have. Because he is the answer to every human need. For those who will give their hearts and their lives to him, he is the answer. He's not just simply uh, the one who will explain the answer. The answer is not just doctrines and ideas. The answer is Jesus he comes in as a replacement for the life that we need to be willing to lay down. And I'll tell you, in his strength and when we live according to his purpose, everything, whatever we have is enough because it's his blessing that makes it effective to do whatever he calls us to do. So that's his message. I came to you in what? Weakness. And fear. Paul, you're afraid to stand up in front of people and, and talk, talk to them about the Lord? Paul? Give me a break. What's going on here? But this is Paul's words. Do you think he was lying? you think Paul got in situations where he said, oh God, I can't do this. You know, I remember reading or hearing, or I have probably, probably read this about Billy Graham's testimony and how how many times in his ministry, especially in the early days, he would just have this sense of, oh God, I, I can't do this. I mean, he would be, you know, shortly before going out in front of these massive crowds and just have this overwhelming sense of inability and, in, and in, insecurity and just all the feelings that would be natural to anybody who says, I just can't do this. And yet, you wind up saying, Lord, but you can. I just, I just surrender this, all of this to you. And you step out in faith and you do what God has put before you to do. Do you know that's not just for people to stand in front of crusades? Do you know that's for people who work on a job? People who go to school, people who study, people who own businesses, people who run homes, people who do every single thing that we as human beings are called upon to do. Everything is meant to be energized from heaven. And I'll tell you, as we walk with God according to that truth, according to that principle, we're going to see God do things. And God might want you to do something that we might consider ministry. I don't know. He might want you to step so far out of your comfort zone that you would be naturally inclined to throw up your hands and, and laugh. Of course, Sarah laughed, didn't she? But who had the last laugh? God had the last laugh because there was a bouncing baby boy in, in about a year. The Lord fulfilled his promise in the face of human absolute inability, impossibility. Folks, do we really believe the words of Jesus when he spoke about the, the vine and the branches and said, without me you can do nothing? But you know, we don't like to learn that. We just don't naturally think that way. We don't want to feel that kind of inability. We would love to feel like we can rouse up our zeal and we can do something for God. Folks, all we can do is exactly what the Lord told Peter. How many times have, has the Lord brought out what he sped and poked to Brother Thomas so many years ago? Peter the zealous, one who always was wanting to run and do for Jesus. And the Lord says, when you, when you were young, you girded yourself. You went where you wanted to go. But when you're old, you'll stretch forth your hand. That's a sense of, I can't do this, Lord. I need you. And another will gird you. 
and carry you where you don't want to go. See, we're going to be in situations that are not comfortable for this guy and that gal or whoever. But I'll tell you what, I would rather be in the center of God's will. I would rather have something happening through this unworthy, unable life. I would rather have something that lasts for eternity than to be something great in the eyes of men and accomplish so much that it just winds up getting burned up. But that's, what, that's God's plan for you this morning. And somehow, I, I, I don't know how to, what to do except just to say it and just trust God to make it, make it live. You and I are exactly where Paul was. Now, his calling was to stand before men and proclaim the Word of God. Yours might not be that. But in God's eyes, what you're doing is just as important to Him. He designed you to be somebody that He cares about in His kingdom. You might be somebody humble like Sophie the washerwoman. But I'll tell you, there's something in the heart of God that was just enjoying the, this woman who's just lived for, gave everything she had and just worship God and wasn't discontent with her lot in life, didn't say, oh, I wish I could be somebody, I wish I could do this if I had more. She just gave what she had. And it was enough to do stuff that, that will last, like I say, there's going to be people in heaven, many, because she was faithful right where she was at. I don't know that there's anybody here who is that disadvantaged in life. I don't know. doesn't matter. But I want to, I, I, the message that keeps coming to me, because there's, there's something in me, there's something in every one of us, if only. We live lives of futility because if only, and it becomes an excuse for just laying down, not doing what God has given us to do, not being what God wants us to be, even if it's right there, just doing the simple things of life, but doing it with His Spirit and His wisdom. There's something in me that the Lord keeps, keeps reminding me just to, just to let go and, and be thankful for what I do have, thankful for my weakness. If that's what it takes for His Spirit to do something, then thank God. That's how Paul looked at it. I was with you in weakness and fear, fear and much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. God wants every life here to touch people in your world. And our inclination, as I say, is to say, if only, if I were this, if I were that, if I had more time, if I had more of this, you just start where you're at and offer what you do have to God because I mean, is God stupid? He called you to be something. Did He not give you what you need to be what He called you to be? Do we need natural resources or do we need heavenly resources? He, he I mean, He delivered the children of Israel with an 80-year-old man and a stick. And the stick became a symbol, but He could have done it without the stick. What does He need? He spoke, and the, and the universe was created. This is an amazing God. All He needs is people who trust Him enough to give Him their hearts and their lives and say, Lord, I give you what I have. Show me your plan. Show me your will. And I'm going to step into it. And if I run into a need that is obviously beyond every human resource, if, if it's your plan and your will, I'm going to step into it. And I'll tell you, we, we serve a God who can do what He did through Jesus on that day. Over and over again, we see someone and I could just see the looks on your, your faces. Yeah, right. But you see, there's a voice talking in your head right now that isn't coming from the Lord, if that's the case. Because God wants you to see Him the way He sees you. He wants you to see yourself the way He sees you. If you're His child, He has, he has made you a brand new creation. And He has given you what you need to be what He's called you to be. All we have to do is start where we're at and say, God, I give you what I have. Show me what to do. And then do it. It's real complicated. I mean, you have to go to seminary to get this, right? 
Oh, how we try to complicate what God has called us to do. So I just pray that God will make this simple truth real to us and help us to realize we have what we need. Here's your title. We have what we need. We just need to believe it and walk in it. And I tell you, God is faithful. Praise God.